Now let's start with Australia, one of the early adapters. Back in 1 July 2017, they started to collect VAT on remote services. So who are in scope? It's non-resident businesses that uh, import services to consumers and also the electronic distribution operators or EDPs. As you can see, there is a wide range of services and other than uh, the EU where it was mainly highly automated services and at least until 2021, when there was some human intervention involved, it was outside the scope. That is not the case in Australia. Also, professional services can be in the scope, but also live streaming and distant learning courses where there is actually a teacher standing in front of the camera. It is in scope of the levy, so quite a broad range. How has Australia done it? Well, they apply, obviously, the destination principle. They make non-resident suppliers taxable, and they have introduced a simplified procedure, where normally in Australia you register for an ABN number. These simplified procedures give you an Australian reference number, or ARN, and via simplified portal you can remit the VAT, or the GST, I must say, of course, in Australia, and also make the payments. Uh, to uh, the bank in Australia. Payments are made in Australian dollars and uh, platforms or the EDPs are also liable. So you can see that Australia as an early adopter completely respected the OECD principles. Now, a more recent uh, example, Cambodia started uh, last year. Non-resident companies uh, previously have a PE, but via the system they can register. They have a threshold of $15,000, and uh, yeah, it includes also the operators of the electronic platform. Now, if we look at the OECD principles, Cambodia ticks quite a few boxes. Yeah? So they have the destination principle, they have a remote supply registration, they have the platform liability, and they have a simplified procedure. But as you can see, they have the system, but I also have the red cross there because it's not all that simple. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the registration form that can be downloaded, but it has to be handed in on paper. Not only has it be handed in on paper, as you can see on the form on the right middle, you have to glue a passport photo of the company representative, which of course makes it uh, difficult. Eh? We prefer an online uh, portal where you can get registered, but here yeah, you really need to send via the post or the courier, of course, this form with the photo of the director of the company so he, can, he or she can be recognized uh, there. So that not make it uh, easy. Another thing that makes the registration and complying difficult in Cambodia is the way that the VAT is collected. Uh, so you make the return in uh, the local currency on a certain day, then you make the payment, which you then can do in another currency, but you have to match the amount reported at the day of uh, reporting. And of course, uh, with volatile exchange rates, it can be difficult to exactly match the payment. So you have to take into account overpayments and also some local bank charges. So it's a good step uh, in the right direction, but there's definitely some room for improvement for Cambodia. Then the largest economy in the Asian region that implemented GST already uh, quite a while ago, uh, July 2017 was when the GST was introduced in a short period. Before that, there was a service tax on digital services already applicable. But uh, yeah, it's been there for a while, this, uh, this GST on digital services. It has a broad application. Um, as you can see, India ticks most of the boxes. Uh, so uh, yes, they have this destination principle, a specific rule for remote suppliers. The GST return is somewhat uh, simplified and also platforms are liable. However, there is some room for improvement because besides the GST obligation, India also loaded on sellers the equalization levy which is a kind of a digital service tax that is levied in addition to the GST. And uh, once the threshold is uh, reached, uh, you are also uh, liable for this equalization uh, levy that has to be paid. It's a quarterly return. India for GST has monthly returns. Uh, they have to be filed uh, normally by the 20th of uh, the month. And yeah, the payment also can cause uh, some uh, difficulties. Now, we also have seen some updates uh, very recently as of 1 October in the, the India GST area. One is that had the human intervention, uh, which is still in the EU rules as well, has been dropped as of 1 October. And that means that also electronically supplied services that do not have minimum human intervention, but to some extent have human intervention. So where there's actually a person involved, also those services as of 1 October are in the scope. Uh, next to that, there has been a significant rate increase. And so the normal rate is 18%, but for online gaming, so for games of chance, 
there is an additional rate. So there's now a rate of 28% that applies since uh, 1 October, where there is a gambling aspect uh, to the service. And uh, lastly, although GST is only collected on B2C supplies since last month, also supplies to B2B buyers have to be listed in the GST return. And this resembles, of course, the European European sales listing uh, that uh, has to be uh, completed. So a good collection of the GST identification number of the India customer has to be stored uh, because it has to be reported uh, later on. And uh, yeah, these additional requirements make that it's, it's a simplified system, but uh, not as simple uh, as the OECD has intended, I would say. Moving on to Indonesia. Also, relatively recent country with the introduction. The rate is uh, 10% in Indonesia. So they have the destination principle. They have the remote supplier seller obligation. It's a simplified procedure, procedure, but it is not that simple. And also digital platforms have a liability. Now, what is the difficulty in Indonesia? It is the fact that there is a two-way reporting. Namely, the VAT return is filed quarterly, whereas the payment has to happen monthly. So there's a monthly billing code. So based on the monthly sales for the VAT amount payable, you have to generate a billing code on their portal. And once all three monthly payments are in, then you can allocate these payments to the quarterly VAT return and submit the quarterly VAT return there. So it's a bit of a hassle. So you have four reportings per quarter. And also to get the payments there, that can take some uh, trial and error because the bank has to receive exactly the amount that is on the billing code. Otherwise, the tax authority is very happy to just send back the money. So especially in the early stages, uh, it's uh, sometimes a bit unpredictable what uh, the chain of uh, banks is that is involved in the payment. And if there is few uh, dollars taken out of it, then yeah, you can easily get uh, underpayment. Fortunately, the payment can be made in uh, dollars. Uh, so it's uh, that makes it easier. Also, the currency that can be used uh, can be uh, beneficial. So it's a simplified system, but uh, with some uh, some complications. Now, speaking of complication, uh, let's talk about Japan. Very early adopter of Japan Consumption Tax, or JCT, on digital services. Tax is quite broad range, as you can see, online advertising, software, cloud services, streaming, it's all taxed. Tax at a rate of 10%, so they tick many of the boxes. There is a destination principle, there is a remote supplier obligation. Procedures are somewhat simple, and soon there is also a platform liability. However, there is some complication, and that is in the qualification of the services as B2B and B2C. Normally, you would look at, in most of the countries, you would look at for B2B service on whether it is supplied to a business. So if they provide a VAT or GST number, then you would say they are a business and you apply the reverse charge. If they don't have a tax number that they supply, then you regard it as B2C. However, in Japan, it works a little bit different. B2C services are services that can be sold to a consumer. So if you have a software license for uh, your computer operating uh, system, uh, yeah, both a business and a consumer need that. So if the conditions of the sale are so that a consumer can also buy it, it is a B2C service. So whether you sell it to a business or a consumer, you will need to charge JCT on that. If it's clear that a li license, software license is an enterprise license for 100 uh, users, then it is a B2C service and you can recharge it. So there is some complication in that. Another complication is determining your taxability. And the JCT has a base period of two years where you have to track whether you exceed the threshold, threshold of 10 million yen. So also tracking that and knowing as of what moment you are taxable uh, is not always easy for uh, taxpayers to find out. And you definitely help uh, need help from a local agent uh, in that respect. In addition, also as of 1 October, there is a qualified invoice system. So if you sell to a B2B customer in order for them to be able to reclaim the, GS, the J JCT, you need to be uh, on that uh, invoice uh, system. So also that creates some additional complication. And that means that we do not see all green green ticks there, but also for the simplified procedure, it's so-so. Moving on with Kazakhstan, also relatively new uh, country, started in January 2022. So Kazakhstan also taxes the services supplied by foreign companies. They need to remit a 12% tax. Uh, but Kazakhstan has taken a very different approach than the OECD says. So they apply the destination principle. They have this remote supplier registration obligation. 
But simplified procedure, well, you can ask if it's really simplified. They've done this on purpose. And what is the rule in Kazakhstan? You don't submit a VAT return. So you don't submit the return. You only make a payment. So you register. While you register, you don't even get a tax number. You get a number on the list, but yeah, that is updated alphabetically. So even your number on the list on the website uh, is subject to change a few times per year. So you have nothing to show that you are registered. Um, you have to pay via uh, a range of banks without having a VAT return copy that you can show. Uh, so that makes it all pretty complicated to do business in uh, in Kazakhstan. So how does it uh, that work? Well, you determine... 12% on your revenue in Kazakhstan, and then you make a payment to the tax office. They gladly provide their bank account number. So without a return, you make this payment. And then yeah, it's best to, to contact the tax authority and say, this is the amount that we have paid for this period. And then they will publish it on their website. And normally, tax authorities maintain a level of secrecy on your affairs. Well, this does not bother the Kazakhstan authority. They will put in the national currency uh, the amount of VAT reported for a certain period on the website for everybody to see. So you can see how much you have paid, but also how much your competition had paid. And you can see if there is still room to grow market share. A very odd approach, I would say. I don't think this will be repeated by other countries. And my recommendation for the Kazakhstan tax authority would be introduce a portal where you just file a VAT return so you can reconcile the payment to the amount reported and to just make it easier. Payments can be made in a variety of currencies. So that is uh, that is a good approach. Uh, but uh, yeah, just to get it then allocated on the website in the local currency, it just makes doing business very difficult. And uh, yeah, I would recommend them to uh, to stick with uh, the guidelines of the OECD. Moving on with Malaysia, mentioned already that Malaysia is uh, introducing an addition to uh, the current system for low value imports. Well, the service tax in Malaysia is uh, levied via a portal on a range of services, also with some exceptions, like there is an uh, exemption for online magazines, so they don't need to uh, be uh, registered. Uh, the rate is uh, 6%. There is a threshold applicable of 500,000 ringgit. And yeah, the filing is quarterly. I would say they take all the boxes of the OECD. The only thing to think of is that you can only close off the VAT return for a period once you have uploaded the payment proof. So they do want to check whether you have paid. And at the moment that you upload this payment proof, it's right away approved. And then only it is closed. If you haven't uploaded the payment proof after the deadline, you will get the penalty, which is then deducted again once you upload the payment proof. So it's one extra step to the return that you have to think about. But all in all, very well implemented the OECD principles in Malaysia. Nepal is a relatively new country also that has rules for non-residents. Uh, they levy 13% VAT on the usual digitally supplied services. If you look at the OECD principles, well, they do quite well. Is it very simplified? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, the simplification is that you work on a platform of the tax authorities completely in Nepalese. And the only simplification is that there is a Word document available uh, with uh, English explanation of what you are doing on the portal. So that is, of course, not as simplified as the OECD uh, means it and also makes the access to, to the rules that apply uh, makes it uh, more uh, difficult. But uh, all in all, it's a step in the right direction for uh, Nepal. But yeah, a portal with uh, English uh, capabilities uh, would uh, come in handy. Language is, of course, not an issue when it comes to uh, New Zealand. They implemented uh, the GST on digital services uh, already quite early in October 2016 and also expanded this to low value imports a few years uh, later. It's uh, taxable uh, on a large range of digital services and yeah, they have a very nice working portal that where you can register previously. Registration was by email. Also, that has gone to a uh, simplified uh, portal and uh, yeah. As I mentioned, uh, also low value and imports can be reported. And, and for that, New Zealand is quite unique in the registration form. You can also opt to tra charge tax on uh, non-low value imports. So import sales from outside the country with a higher value than a thousand New Zealand dollars can be reported via this mechanism if you opt in uh, for that. So uh, yeah, perfectly implemented. So the OECD principles have a very approachable a tax authority and to also accommodate service providers like us uh, that uh, help many clients to comply in New Zealand. I think we are one of the first 
companies from outside New Zealand that were recognized as a local bookkeeper uh, so that we could make, could make full use of the agent portal of uh, the authorities. Uh, so uh, completely green sheet for New Zealand. So well done there. Moving on to South Korea. Also quite early in the adaptation of the rules, uh, this back to 2015, if I remember correctly, it was one of the first countries outside of Europe where I helped a digital service provider with the registration. It's a simplified uh, system for uh, yeah, the usual set of uh, online supplied services, VAT rate of uh, 10 and registration is via a, a portal. And uh, yeah, the payment is uh, in uh, in Korean won, and so that is the only obstruction. But otherwise, you can pay to a dedicated bank account uh, number, so uh, payments can never go missing. And uh, yeah, the destination principle applies just like the other requirements for the OECD. So South Korea, it's a very comprehensive uh, system and uh, easy to comply for uh, non-resident uh, companies. Uh, so uh, yeah, all green ticks for uh, for South Korea. Well, that we cannot say about uh, Taiwan. Taiwan made the implementation originally quite straightforward and simple, but at the introduction uh, at the time in uh, 2017 already mentioned that their local invoicing system uh, would apply down the line. So originally it was a straightforward filing, usual set of services were in the scope. There is a simplified uh, portal for non-residents to register for the VAT in Taiwan. The rate is 5%, so the rate is not uh, too high. But once registered, then the fund starts uh, because it's not only filing the B bi-monthly VAT returns, which are not uh, uploaded by completing it, but it's an upload of a uh, specific uh, CSV file uh, that you need to complete. Uh, next to that, you need to obey the local tax invoice rules. And that means that you have to issue your invoice with EGUI FAT number. So that's a number that is generated by the government. So you have to work with a local supplier by a slot of invoice uh, numbers. And that invoice numbers you have to put on your invoice because that helps the customers in Taiwan to join in a national lottery of invoice uh, numbers. And that is uh, helping to increase compliance in the country. But of course, for a non-resident, it's a lot of hassle making your sales, but then also having to issue these EGUI numbers. And without the EGUI numbers, it's impossible to file uh, the VAT return as it uh, should be done. So there's no way around it. And as icing on the cake, then also there is a corporate income tax or a digital service tax that applies. Although it is somewhat simplified, it's hard to do it without local assistance. And on the right bottom, you can see how it is determined. So you can do a full calculation of your tax obligation by opening your books to show your cost base for the services applied in Taiwan. But if that's not the case, then there is a simplified way of doing it. And for that, you need to ask for permission. But also that is very complicated. So although they made a few good steps in the right direction, in general, I would say that Taiwan is a very complicated country to sell your digital services into. So yeah, one clear red cross for simplified procedure, because although it's somewhat simplified, it's not worth mentioning. It's a hard country to do business in. Then uh, Thailand, Thailand also relatively uh, new, just uh, two years uh, levying this uh, this VAT. They have a 1.8 million Thai baht threshold, so you don't immediately end up uh, paying taxes. The rate is 7%, we just had some misunderstanding, of course, uh, because they reduced this rate to 7% during the COVID uh, times. It was supposed to go up again um, after the summer, but... Uh, with the new government in place and uh, one of the first acts to increase the VAT rate uh, with uh, with 3%. Uh, they did not think that was a good idea. So that was withdrawn and the reduced standard VAT rate was extended. Uh, it was quite hard to get some information on that from uh, the tax office. Uh, so if you look at that requirement from the OCD, that was not very easily followed. In general, the Thai portal is comprehensive. There's a lot of explanation uh, provided. The only limitation is the, uh, the payment reference, which is valid for only a short period of time. If you exceed that, uh, money is uh, right away sent back. And then that takes a, a while before it ends up in your bank account. So you can make the, the new payment. And on top of that, the penalties in uh, Thailand for a late payments are quite high, even a short overrun of the period, uh, which can easily happen uh, when you deal with uh, taxes in many countries. Uh, there is a significant penalty also for yeah, just a short uh, overrun. So this is something to take into account and to uh, make the payments to Thailand uh, well on time. Moving on to Vietnam, also a relatively uh, newer country in Vietnam. The uh, services in scope are 
uh, the ones that we recognize also from other countries. Tax rate is uh, 10% in Vietnam, but it's important to notice that this tax exists for 5% of VAT and 5% of corporate income tax. Now, you don't need to have a separate registration to remit the corporate income tax. It is enough to be registered only for the uh, for the VAT because the VAT return will have two lines, one for remitting the VAT and one for remitting the corporate income tax. Taxable base is uh, the same. So uh, yeah, it's two lines with the same and five and five is uh, 10%. So it's a quarterly uh, return. So it, generally it's a quite straightforward registration process also to make the returns for the two taxes. So that works nicely. Only difficulty we encounter sometimes with it takes a while to allocate to the payment, but generally the tax office is quite responsive to ask, when you ask to make the uh, the allocation. But uh, yeah, Vietnam and generally uh, ticks the boxes of the simplified procedures. Only difficulty is that uh, the added tax, the digital service tax. Well, that concludes the review of the GST and VAT rules in the region. Lastly, I want to touch upon some uh, DST updates, some were already covered during uh, the presentation. So in addition to the VAT, we see countries also imposing simplified mechanism on digital service tax. We've discussed it uh, for uh, Vietnam, for uh, Taiwan, and also for India with the equalization levy. And this is a trend uh, that is clearly increasing. Of course, we have Pillar 1 uh, waiting for further implementation. So we do expect more and more countries to impose these direct taxes next to the VAT system.